everyone. I'm Rick Bensignor. Yes, I have a call. You can hear it. Today is Tuesday, June 14th. Welcome to this week's In the No Trader show. Well, mixed markets right now, S&P is pretty much flat on the day, but has been up and down substantially already. Um, 10 year up another five basis points, crossing over 3.4% now at 3.42%. Oil's up a little over $2. Natural gas getting hit hard today, down 16%. Uh, Bitcoin down another $630, just under 22,500. The dollar is the cause for a lot of this up a whopping three full points today. Uh, that's about 3% over 105. And gold, uh, having a deal with the dollar strength, down another $15 after getting hit yesterday again. This week, what do we have on tap? Well, let's start things off in our trader education part of today's show. We'll say that sometimes market analysis is actually easy. It's not that often that it is, but there are times it is. And we'll show you an example of something that just occurred. That was kind of um, very easy to spot. Secondly, in our macro overview, we'll take a look at financial sector. It's struggling this month, even with interest rates going higher. Uh, so we'll take a look at the XLF as well as the XLF versus the S&P. And then we'll go through as many of these names in the financial sector as possible, going chart by chart through them. To sign up to get my weekly ETF Tactical Trader Report or the monthly 7-Eleven Report, uh, go to inthenotrader.com. We have a brand new website. Uh, you can sign up online. There's lots of videos uh, there too. And um, you will see everything that we have to, uh, that we have to offer for you. The 7-Eleven Report is a report that is designed to beat the S&P 500 by being in no more than seven of the 11 spider macroeconomic sectors like XLK, XLE, XLI, et cetera, but no more than seven of them with the goal of trying to avoid the underperformers. So here are stats year to date. Um, first off, we are outperforming by 334 basis points this year. That is significant without this even halfway through the year. Our fiscal year that starts every August 1st, we're outperforming by almost 4.4%. And since we started 22 months ago, we are outperforming by 698 basis points, essentially 7% in less than two years. Um, this, these type numbers are actually outstanding for the money management industry in being in a fund that essentially is just the market itself. Um, you will be hard pressed to find people who beat this being in the S&P. So there are other type funds that are diversified across other instruments, but just to beat the spiders at a very insignificant cost. Uh, so I've priced it as, as being that it comes out just once a month, I've made it very, very reasonably priced. The other thing I want to tell you is that I am shortly going to start my own YouTube channel um, under the banner of In the No Trader. And, you know, if you like the type of work I do, and based upon seeing how many people view this show on YouTube every week, we are averaging almost a thousand people a week. I'm going to make you an, a, a deal. Go follow my YouTube channel now. If I get 250 people signing up to follow the channel, I will start my own. YouTube channel for In The No Trader, all right? So I leave it to you to go and start following the channel now, even though I don't have content up there. I mean, if you're listening to this show and you wanna keep listening to this show, then go and sign up for um, or follow my YouTube channel. All right, let's take a look at just uh, the macro sectors themselves, what they're doing simply month to date. This is not year to date, it's what's going on in the month of June so far. So the S&P is down 9.2%. Five of the sectors are worse than that. Discretionary, communication services, tech, financials, and real estate. Obviously, energy continues to be 
the best performer, only down about 3.6%. Um, that's that's uh, you know significantly ahead of what the S&P is doing, although down. Uh, and obviously, staples um, are the next best. And then other ones start getting closer to what the S&P is doing. So you're still getting um, a lot of negative movement in, you know, it's not, it's not hard to expect discretionary and technology getting hit given the most recent news and how the market's trading. The surprising one to many is still how financials and REITs are now. REITs are getting competition from higher bond prices, but uh, so that makes sense. But financials, you know, the traditional thinking is that with higher interest rates, financial companies do well. But what the marketplace and investors don't like is just how fast interest rates have moved up and what the effect may be on some of these financial companies. And that is why it's actually trailing and trailing badly uh, to the market. So that's, the, you know, that's kind of the surprise and what people really have to try to think about and figure out how to act smart right now. Let's go to trader education. And so what we said is that, um, here we go. Sometimes market analysis is actually easy. So let me give you an example of something. Here's the Dow Jones, uh, the diamonds, right? So this tracks the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's the ETF that tracks the same thing like spiders are to the S&P, QQQs are to the NASDAQ 100, the diamonds are to the Dow Jones. It's the easiest way to trade those 30 stocks as one stock collectively. So here's our basic candle chart going back on the uh, far left side, you've got the, the low from the COVID low. And then, of course, um, up here is your all-time high. So let's take a look at some of the things that even basic technicians can do. And again, sometimes it works as simply as you'd want it to, almost like textbook ways of teaching people this is how good technical analysis can be. Doesn't often work this simply, but in this case, it did. So let's take a look at where the breakdown come off of those February lows. Well, the low close was here in February as it was uh, in May until it broke. So let's just say that that is where we broke down from. So the rally that we saw, the over 6% rally that we got a few weeks back kind of topped into this level and three weeks in a row at top. So not only do we have resistance from there, and that kind of be first level resistance, but for those of you who know candlestick patterns, this is essentially a uh, evening star pattern, large, strong up candle, followed by a doji, followed by virtually the inverse. So it totally unwound the rally. So another thing that uh, you wouldn't have known that until the end of last week, but you at least saw for three weeks in a row this stalling at the same place. What else can we add to this? Well, you know, I like cloud charts. Look at what the cloud chart said. Not only did the rally stop against the bottom of the diamonds weekly cloud, right? So resistance, but the conversion line, which is in pink, which is the fastest of the lines, also caught all these highs here. They happen to come together, that much more strong resistance. Anything else you see from this cloud chart? Well, if you know how to read them, you know that the lagging line, which is nothing more than current price pushback 26 bars, this low in here, this close was this close here. And the rally from a few weeks back was this move in the lagging line right against the top of its cloud. So the same time, that price was hitting the bottom of the cloud, the lagging line was hitting resistance at the top of the cloud. Just that much more reason that in this particular case, this was an easier call than typical. In other words, lots of things lined up to anticipate that the market could easily run into trouble where it did. Now let's take a look at where it might go on the downside. So one of the things I'm going to add to this is the TDST line. This is part of DeMarc's sequential model. And here I'll just put, let's say, uh, I'll put up sequential here. And anytime you do a setup nine count up, which here counts up in blue, which is nine consecutive closes above the close from four bars prior, the lowest low gets 
uh, a dotted line coming out as being a theoretical support level. So if we were to look at this, you'll see it's just about at 300, a little bit lower than where we've gotten to. So right now we're trading at about 305, so about five points lower, potential support. Any other support down there? Well, look, the lagging line against the bottom of the cloud, also 300. And if I remember, there was one more thing. If I put up the propulsion model, which is another one of the models I look at, designed by Tom DeMarc, the propulsion exhaustion level currently is 301 and change. So just beneath this week's low, today is only Tuesday, so we still have more to go. We could see potential support here. So if I'm a trading short, then I probably look for something in the 301, 300 level to cover at least half. If it breaks further, then it has a lot more room to fall down to other targets. But this could very well be a place we get a bounce from. May or may not be, but it's if you're a trader, it's not a bad place to think about taking in some of the shorts simply because I've got one, two, three unrelated models all saying that there's potential targets right in and around the 300 level. So sometimes this stuff actually ends up being easy and anyone who kind of just knows simple, basic technical analysis, um, like if you consider yourself in the, in the farm leagues of technical analysis, kind of a newbie, this is even stuff you could have seen yourself simply from, even if I take the DeMarc stuff away, which I'll do here now, you can still see, you could have drawn this line and seen where was resistance. You could have seen the cloud bottom, the conversion line. You could have seen the lagging line against the cloud. And you can see where the lagging line would come and hit the bottom of the cloud. So a lot of this you can do on your own. Now, again, it's not always this easy, but this one was kind of easy in the scheme of things. Um, so I, I proffer this up this week in, in the sense of saying, it doesn't need to be complicated, um, or at least not always. Sometimes it is. And I think, you know, kind of the work we do what separates us from what most people do on the street is that most people are using basic technical analysis um, to do what they do, and they miss a ton of turns, and they also often buy breakouts that end up being false or sell breakdowns that be, end up being false because they don't have other tools in their tool bag. We do, I've been doing, as you know, I've been doing this for 40 years. And I've been you know, a trader on Wall Street, a uh, sell side strategist, buy side portfolio manager. I've kind of worn all the hats there are. And I can tell you that the models I use, I believe are the best models out there. Um, and it's models that I have worked with institutional clients on. They're developing skills in them. And my institutional clients all use these models. And I've brought them to you in the In the Know Trader newsletters that I write that you can subscribe to. You know, I bring this to you in those um, newsletters and, and get into much more detail and how to use these, et cetera. Um, but anyway, I just thought, you know, it was interesting that, that this is something that you could have easily seen and, and done yourselves uh, simply based upon some simple analysis. Let's take a look at, um, we're going to focus on the financials this week. So let's start off with XLF. And, you know, we've been straight down like everything else since January. Notice we're getting close. And then let me pull this up a bit so you can see. There happen to be two, they both are colored red, but they're unrelated to each other. So I've got a downside target in the XLF at 3101. And then the TDST line is at 3089. That's only 12 cent differential from where there is uh, support at this point. But I'll say this in here, let's put the cloud on. You'll see the cloud model also has the lagging line is gonna be very close. It's a little lower for the next few weeks at 30 and a half, um, but you're in that kind of range that if you're short or you wanna do some buying, you may consider doing some. However, if this level doesn't hold, then you're talking about numbers in the mid to upper 20s as next downside targets. So you have a propulsion target at 27.80, another one at 26.97, and an unfilled gap going from the fall of, uh, what was that, 2020, that's still unfilled. 
So I think it's pretty darn important that you know, it's going to put, you can see it's got resistance against its conversion line, conversion line high, conversion line high for the last several weeks. So, you know, this is structurally weak and potentially can get weaker, but I can also just draw a simple line from where this, somewhere around here, playing games with me. There we go. This is where we broke out from, right? I had highs here, we sold off, we paused at those highs, we pulled back and then we left through them. This is where we broke out from. So another reason that somewhere down in here, under 30, you know, 31 to about 30 and a half is really important support. So that's how the XLF looks. Let's look at XLF versus the S&P. Pure trading range since first quarter last year. Almost three highs at the same level. That used to be an old low. And now we have multiple bottoms near what was an old high. So um, I, I am overweight financials. We came back in on this nine count a few weeks back. We're really kind of in the same place. We had the first move up. Uh, it's pulled back and it's kind of hanging in here. And you have to figure at what point are people going to accept that the higher interest rates may actually be good for financials, which is how we always thought of them. It's the, it's the speed of the increase in interest rates that people are concerned about. So for now, I'm, I'm kind of playing this range, looking for, look, if I drew a line here, a line here, you kind of see that all the lows are caught against prior highs. So I'm playing this range that ultimately we can come back to the other side. So I am overweight here. Don't really want to see it break down much, but I am willing to play it on overweight basis. All right, let's take a look at um, all the key names in the XLF. We're going to start with Berkshire Hathaway, the largest weighted name. Uh, this is on a set of nine count this week. It's the first one we've seen probably in years. Let's see how far back. So we haven't had a set of nine counts since when was that? Summer of 2018. And that was the low of the move. So here we are now. Um, a little bit lower is where all these lows are. We call that 272 and a half or so. Um, and notice that the lagging line within a couple of weeks would also hit the top of the cloud at the same level. So we're trading at 280, uh, almost 281 in buying Berkshire. We, we can, you can at least make a case for it and that you're not just blindly buying, but you're actually buying into some known support. Doesn't mean it's gonna work. It obviously depends on just how bad things get over time. Um, but that that is, you know, first level uh, support at this point and resistance um, is gonna first be the top of the cloud. So if let's say we bounce off here, we probably have some against the top of the cloud going into July near 300-ish. And then also the falling conversion line will be kind of your first level resistance there. So buying this does not infer that this is going to turn around and make new all-time highs. I can't say it will, but it is a place that if you're looking to buy um, at a lot lower price than it's been in you know more than six months, that that you'd at least be buying into support. Okay, JP Morgan, don't like the fact that we've broken beneath the weekly cloud and the lagging lines broken beneath the weekly cloud. That's still weak. Um, look, I can see this here. You've got that same evening star pattern. Open on the low, closed on the high. Doji open near the high, closed near the low. So this, you know, this is done the same thing as the market did. Um, you've got other targets down here anywhere from one. Potentially good is if we hold this level here, one eighteen sixty seven this week, then you may see a bounce from there. But um, you'd have to, you know, come back up and hold that level by Friday's close. Otherwise. This looks like it's heading lower. So not one of the better. I mean, we're, we're just starting at looking at these charts, but Berkshire, let's say, is a better name than VA, uh, JP Morgan, just from a pure chart point of view. Uh, here's Bank America. Uh, it's also now playing with an important TDST line support and a, and a propulsion level right here, but it is tucking through the bottom of the cloud. Count-wise, it's not near the end of a count. So it either holds right here and turns around or this likely goes lower too. Um, and with the first target down, if it breaks, it's 25.85. So that's well lower. Um, and there is an unfilled gap here too, back from fourth quarter 2020. Wells Fargo, 
coming out through the bottom of the cloud. Um, no particular support right here, the way it's acting, unless it gets back above 39.55 by uh, Friday's close. Otherwise, I'd look for this to still trade lower down to 34.5 to 32.40 or so. SPGI, which is S&P Global. So this is broken through, cloud's broken through. The only thing you might have here is a nine count against. So it's trading 316 down near 303 is the propulsion exhaustion level. Uh, you'd want to see that hold or this could fall all the way down to 239 or so. So really important that this holds in the coming week or two. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, resistance, first level resistance would be the conversion line. Second would be the bottom of the cloud on the way back up. Morgan Stanley, my old shop. Um, we threw the cloud, same three candle pattern uh, into coming into this week. Um, lagging line is still in the cloud. Support down at about 84 and then stuff not into the upper 60s. So a lot of these names, you see that if it doesn't hold some shorter term support kind of just beneath where it's trading, there is quite a bit of room on the downside before you get to next targets. Goldman Sachs, same thing, just tucking underneath the bottom of its cloud really kind of wants needs to hold in here. Otherwise, downside targets are 278 and 246. A lot of these are problematic looking charts. American Express, set up nine count last week. We came through the cloud now, lagging line is coming into the cloud. The most important support here is at 140.68. Um, that's that TDSD line. If that doesn't hold, then we're gonna get down towards 130, if not lower. Citibank, this is I think the closest of all of them to getting towards a 13. We're on a 11 count this week. There is two unrelated support levels, one at 42.71, one at 42.39. So let's just say the mid 42s, there is support. If it doesn't hold there, then you're talking about testing lows from COVID. On a bounce back, look for resistance at 57 and a quarter. First things first. Um, Charles Schwab, SCHW. Same three candle pattern, a uh, little bit of strength this week in the sense that we're now actually up from Monday's open, um, lagging line in the cloud. Look for support down near 54 and a half ish to 55 and a half ish. Resistance right now is going to be about 68 or so um, initially, and then much more important resistance near 76 if it got up there. Hard to, hard to make the case right now why any of these are going to get big rallies, but just trying to identify for you where all these key numbers are. Um, same type of thing here. BlackRock continues its downtrend. Uh, same three candle pattern you know, coming into this week, holding on to propulsion exhaustion level at 586. If that breaks, look for this to finish down to a 13 count, down to 484 to 470 or so. Um, first resistance continues to be the conversion line. Secondary, look at about 744 or so. Chubb, one of the better looking charts, decently above its cloud, uh, kind of sideways for most of this year. So definitely one of the strongest names we've seen, if not the strongest name, um, right on its propulsion bearish level, but it's disqualified this week because last week was down week. So closing beneath it would not get me short, but it would suggest that we could potentially go lower and then play with targets here that over the next several weeks are all gonna line up somewhere near the top of the cloud of just a little above and a little below. Definitely the best name we've seen so far. Marsh McClellan, MMC. Okay, 13 on the top. Spike rejected the 13 stop out level on an A count here. If you like the insurance names, then potentially next week on a move to the low 140s, may be your place to get in with a fairly tight stop. Chicago Mercantile Exchange, this will be the last one that we take a look at, has built a little bit of a bottom here, uh, tried to bounce, but ran out of steam at the bottom of the cloud and pulling back. New lows would not necessarily suggest much bigger move down, so support at 184 and change. If that breaks, then you're talking about 163 and change. That's it for this week. Again, if you wanna see and, and follow me, um, Go to YouTube, sign up, and follow the In The Know Trader channel. I'm leaving it to you guys to get enough of you signing up 
in order for me to create my own channel and do this for you. All righty. That's it for this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'm Rick Ben Senior, and this has been In The No Trader. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.